Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for today's program of Junior Don's The Spark. My guest is Leanne Grunberg Wakabayashi. Leanne is the author of her memoir, The Waigamami Bride, A Jewish Family Saga Made in Japan. Welcome, Leanne. Leanne, you wrote a wonderful memoir. Would you tell us about it? Thank you, Junior. I appreciate you bringing me on. Hi from Haifa. Um, I spent 30 years in Tokyo and wrote a memoir about, which on the surface I should say is about a family, an international family, and how they cope, how we managed to uh, exist as a multi-religious, multi-background family. I was married to an acupuncturist who is also, uh, and a, he calls himself a Taoist. His parents are Buddhist Shinto. And, uh, and so I was brought, swept up very much into their world. And at the same time, I came with uh, my Jewish identity from New York. And I would say it was a kind of soft boiled Jewish identity. I was conservative and not really so passionate or, or really, um, knowledgeable about what uh, Judaism had to offer me until my children were born. And then really this story is, um, it pivots on um, the birth of my two children and how I realized that Taoism, Shintoism, Buddhism did not equip me for being a Jewish mother. And there's a lot of humor in this book I would say that uh, this story, which, which is a true story, uh, to the best of my ability, uh, is really a, a reflection on what went right, what I appreciated about this wonderful family that I w belonged to for nearly 30 years, and eventually why I had to go. Do you still keep in touch with your ex-husband? I certainly do. It was his birthday yesterday. I wrote him an email message to wish him happy birthday. Does he visit uh, you? No, he doesn't. We're divorced. And uh, I, I wish him well to get on with his life, just as he wishes the same for me. He read the book. I think he read it twice. He actually asked me uh, if he could have the PDF, and he printed 500 copies in Tokyo. So the book really, from, from, from my point of view, I wanted to write something that was not finger-pointing and not incriminating the other side. It was really um, a reflection on, on how marriages... I think so all across the board have their struggles. And in our case, they were multiplied by us being in an international marriage, me living outside my comfort zone in his country, and then trying to raise two children who had the best of all these identities in their upbringing. What does it mean to you to be a Jewish mother? <laughs> I mean, there's the proverbial Jewish mother, right, Who's, who meddles and who um, has an opinion on everything, who's very into the education of the children. Uh, I had European parents, so that was kind of multiplied by the kind of strict old world mentality that they brought with them to America. Uh, to me, being a, a Jewish mother now, I would say is is modeling, modeling the values that 
I want to give to the children. And I realized that to model them true to myself and the best of my ability, I really needed to move to Israel. Do you think it was a, so a search for soul consciousness? Let me phrase it differently. Was You went to Japan. I took from the book, you went to Japan because you felt a calling to go internally. I'm a journalist, yes. and I was sent twice on assignment, first by Columbia Business School, yes. actually Columbia University, and then the second time by Condé Nast Traveler. So I was really sent there to work, which was an amazing opportunity for someone in, in the 20s. From a talk you gave, you talked about it took you nine years to do it, in part because you had to learn the concept of not using mean words. <laughs> Is that uh, uh, something that was worth learning? Oh, absolutely. And I, here we go back to soul consciousness. You know, you bring you bring it up, and there's the the um, uh, mindset of loshon hara, which is actually uh, guarding one's tongue and and speaking in a way that's not going to harm people. What I meant by soul consciousness is sometimes there's an inner drive uh, for, a, I don't want to call it spirit, a knowingness. And <clears throat> people are called to different actions and different researches. Um, and so much of what I took from the book was your husband was very indulgent, moving to the country and you know other kinds of things. But uh, you had a particular thirst for this inner um, meaning. And I loved, actually, that you talked about Shinto and Buddhism in the books and the parallels to Judaism, where you found them. Um, I mean, a lot of books are written about the search. You call it for consciousness or for, for whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. And um, in the book, there's a quote about if you're happy, uh, to be happy, you have to not really want anything. And to be there already, are you happy now? Or oh, to be content with what one has. That yeah. was a big part of it. That was part of it. But I think what motivated me very much to be in Japan was this, this idea that was percolating in the 80s and even more in the 90s of unity consciousness, that all, all are one, we are all one. And so crossing into his world was a challenge to me to, to see that I was one with his society too, not to think of myself as an outsider. But then I realized that I thought of myself outside my own religion. I, because in Judaism, there, there were the proverbial 12 tribes, meaning 12 points of view and 12 different um, spiritual paths, life paths of the Jews um, that formed the original um, family of Jacob. And so I understood from a young age in New York that I belonged to one tribe, but I wasn't comfortable in that tribe, which was conservative Judaism. And then when I got here, ironically, to, to when I say here, to, to Japan, the only form of Judaism I could find was conservative Judaism. 12 years passed since the day I arrived, and then what happens is Chabad arrives. And Chabad now is all over the world. There's more than 4,000 Chabad houses in every possible country. And even though I had never spoken to anyone from a Chabad, Haredi, ultra-Orthodox persuasion, except in the Lower East Side when I bought my fabrics as a teenager, yeah. um, this was a this was something new. Oh my God! I can actually have a conversation, and it's fun, and it's interesting, and it's inspiring to talk to these people. And I didn't even think of at that point of modeling their behavior. I was just fascinated as a journalist, as a writer, as somebody who was curious about people to understand how they ticked. So I would say that I came into this world out of 
curiosity. It was, it was not, I would call this kind of soul thirst. I wasn't aware of that. It became um, increasingly a soul driven mission. Once I understood that one of my children, my older child was different from her classmate classmates and had a hard time living in Japanese society and trying to help her and trying to understand her um, and consulting with the rabbi and Rebbitzin quite often, uh, I, I came to understand that embracing my Judaism would give me Torah technology to help me be a better mother, to be a more compassionate person, to be maybe more bold and assertive in demanding what I thought was best for my daughter. And then what happened in uh, the, uh, 2011, very soon after the great earthquake, a triple disaster in Japan, my daughter, who had just turned 14, had a psychotic break that put her in the hospital for four months. And suddenly, it was, I think it was for me an almost out of body experience to go from a kind of feeling of normalcy to this hospital, severe hospitalization. And I found that reading to heal him, uh, praying, um, and following more of the Torah mitzvot was actually my way of saying to God, this is more than I could handle. Please help me here. I'll pray to you. You listen, and I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> and and so this was. I would say that's when the journey pivoted, which was uh, about seven eight years ago. So you kept diary as a child. Did you continue through the marriage? I did. I did. I I continued through the marriage to. Uh, write letters and sometimes I would write for the newspaper, the Japan Times, interesting things that were happening in our family. I remember writing about my uh, father-in-law's fourth grade reunion that he went to all his life. And I thought, how bizarre and how sweet. And then I found out that that fourth grade class had all um, fled the carpet bombing of uh, downtown Tokyo in 1945 and lost their school and were scattered and how powerful it was for them to meet every year once they, once they could. So the family was an endless font of amazing stories. So I did record them and I, I knew that that was my mission to record what was going on. I didn't know in the beginning what I was going to do with the material, but I, I thought this is, this is really gold, not only for me, but for, as, for other people, for my, my family back in New York and in Europe who were curious what was going on. Uh, the quotes you attribute to your husband are so beautiful, <laughs> so <laughs> evocative you. of a different philosophy. Uh, I just wondered if they had showed up in a diary somewhere at the time to get the yes. quote accurate. Yes, they're in, they're in my journals. The, the funny thing is, he also began keeping journals and diaries. So if I ever said anything wrong, he could actually go to his journal. And, so I had to be careful in how I quoted him. Oh, <laughs> really very <laughs> nice. Has Israel, living in Israel, changed you? Oh, tremendously! I I think I'm more, I'm more myself here. And and gosh, what is that? What does that even mean? Um, you know, I'm not a I'm not a guest. I'm not a guest. I'm not a guy gene. A guy gene means an outsider. You know, I'm an insider here. I may not speak Hebrew very well. Uh, can't read the documents sent to, into my mailbox, but I feel part of this community, part of this um, lifestyle, and I've chosen an orthodox, a modern orthodox lifestyle. And, and to my joy, I find that people are very warm and welcoming to me and my family. And uh, I brought my daughter when she was 19, and she's 
very doing very very well here my son came for three years of high school he decided to go back to Japan where he now works for the rabbi in kosher foods and he went back um, fluent in Hebrew so I'm very proud of him yeah. that he got further than us and I would say that when he comes and visits Jap uh, from Japan, he's so excited. He, he really feels, too, that this is his country. And, and so that's a thrill that both of my children feel a sense of belonging here. I wonder if you had a sense of belonging when you were first growing up in America. I'll tell you, it was very tricky because I was born in Montreal. And I didn't become a naturalized citizen until my uh, mother did and I was 16 by the time that happened and I'd never even been back to Montreal since I was an infant so I had no memories of Canada so this sense of where do I belong with my British accented mother and my Romanian accent accented father was very much a, a theme in, in, in my mental story from a young age what is there a role for you for your age woman in Israel and how is it different from Japan or America? I continue to teach my art classes online. My students are everywhere in the world and especially Japan. So I'm going back to Tokyo in a few weeks to do a a one month nationwide art tour, which I'm very excited about. So I'm I'm kept busy in in Haifa, connecting with people all over the world through arts. And at the same time, I write for the Jerusalem Post. I'm, v I'm very happy that uh, I can submit stories on topics that I come across here that interest me and uh, that are really inspiring stories about people who are also leading unusual lives, who are doing things, I would say, out of the box, whether it's uh, um, as a artists or as Holocaust survivors or uh, philanthropy. I, I'm always looking for stories that will um, give readers a sense of, of, of just how impressive human beings can be. Yes, oh, um, the range of positivity and the range of negativity, both sides has great range. Uh, I, I thought of you until we met this way. Uh, I thought you, I perceived you as a teacher. First you were learning for yourself and then you wanted to, I don't want to say pass it on, um, you wanted the contact with people perhaps in ways that will allow you to be yourself. I liked your art before um, you got into teaching with cards. You want to say something about that? Because that was kind of interesting. I created a deck of cards called the Genesis cards. And, and they, they, look, they look like this, little cards that uh, are paired with a work of art that you are um, that you create. And when I say paired, you make a work of art using an inspirational theme. There's a, this is the, how the cards are packaged in a set. And there's a guidebook so that uh, you can actually follow exercises to make a work of art. And uh, then what happens is once you've done, let's say I make this work of art and I flip over a random card. I'm going to just choose it to show you how it works. Okay. I'm looking for connections. I'm using um, the Genesis card as a serendipity trigger. And so, okay. So I've say I've uh, done this, uh, done this work here. It looks the little man running and I'm just looking at it and I'm saying, well, I want to get some insight into what it is I've drawn. I see so much energy and I see so much aliveness. And there's also this feeling of maybe being in the cosmos. And then I pick the trust card. And I, then I look again at the little Genesis figure with this sense of, wow, of trust. 
and maybe it could be inside that I'm feeling, wow, I really don't have that much energy. It looks nice to be so energetic and so dynamic, but is that really me? So, you know, when we're creating, we're putting a lot of these, these subconscious thoughts into the art as well. And then these cards kind of cut to the quick and help us really take away a message, an intuitive message from the art we've done. I encourage people to write down what they see in their art as a result of picking a card. And in that way, it becomes a visual journal from the world behind the eyes, helping us uh, tap into our creativity and also go, go further and become bolder in the way we live our lives. Is there, I, I see it's a visual presentation, but what's on the back of the card? Now the back is, is they're all the same. Okay. But the guidebook, uh, the guidebook, if you look every, uh, you could just check which number. So for Genesis, I would go to, uh, they're all numbered, the artworks. So number 18, Genesis, and I would read, there's a, a Well, you thought about message. it. Yes. Yes. There's a gift message, a challenge message, a creativity exercise. This is not to be used like an oracle deck or tarot cards. I mean, some people, if they, they do, they could use it, but they're missing the point and they're missing the opportunity yeah. for creative growth. Yes. Self-knowledge and creative growth, because this really develops artists, artistic skills and self-confidence very, very quickly. Self-confidence. Talk to me about that. How come? Well, I think many people, most of us, me too, we, we have these voices inside our heads that tell us things are not as perfect, as great, as well as they can be, or we compare to other people. Uh, and society and our own family members train us to think oh. that way as, 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 a, as the norm. And what if, what if we could hear a voice inside that's, that's saying everything is okay, everything's perfect as is. Um, I, I, I love you. I love your art. I'm just so um, excited to see what you're creating today. This is the inner artist speaking to you through the art that you're making. And so this is what's happening in the classes that I do in, in the community that, that people are coming with no artistic background and then falling in love with their art through the messages that they're receiving. Beyond interesting, effective. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to be effective. Be, I'll be happy to give you uh, a lesson a demo <laughs> on another day. We'll, we'll show you how it works. Junior, you're, you're prime for it. Oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm taken with the fact that you're a teacher, but I wondered about your energy level. It just seems your life, especially earlier, required uh, great stamina. Luckily, I, I had a grandmother who lived to uh, 100, so that helps. And um, my mother uh, sadly passed away at 84, but she... she uh, she was a smoker. What can I say? Uh, well, you changed your relationship hope, with your mother after she died, was my impression. I felt as I was writing the book that her death allowed me to say, I love you, and how grateful I was to, to her for being her. While she was alive, I think like many moms, she she wanted the best for me based on what she thought was the best for her and it exasperated her that i thought differently i give you an example my mother was a theater lover uh, she graduated from guildhall school of drama in london she takes me to the theater and i fall asleep as soon as the lights go off <laughs> i think it was it was one of these thought how could she produce how could she create a daughter like me so yes, there were these expectations, but once she had passed, I really felt she was sitting on my shoulder and writing the story with me and writing it not only for this generation, but for future generations with 
sending a message of love and affirmation that we do the best we can. We, we, you have to live in your own times. You can't live in another generation's time. So that's a, that is it. So we want to thank Leanne for her sharing of her life and her writing ability and her, her journey, as they call it these days. Her, I call it a quest. It always appears in every society, usually in one form or another. Um, right. But we've, we've learned to be true to that, and sometimes it costs us or hurts another person even. Um, but to be true to yourself and learn to say kind words, not mean words. <laughs> well, I, so this is the book, and, and just um, to say that mean words will only lead to the need to write a, a, a sequel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wanted to save myself that, and I wanted to save that for my family, and I really wanted my children to be able to get on with their lives knowing that that all was well that there was peace restored between their parents and that uh we could look back and remember the best moments that we had together as a family too i think that was very important that's always good moments even in hard relationships yes and that's the story i wanted to frame good thank you my friend if Thank I ever get to Israel, to I'm letting you know. <laughs> oh, you must. You must. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Doan's The Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.